But we want to invite everybody, if you will, to take your Bibles this morning and turn with us to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We've been looking at the letter to the church that was in the city of Corinth. Corinth was a great city in the time that the Scriptures were given to men by the Holy Spirit. It was a city of world trade and world religion. It was a wicked city. It was, it was an insult to tell someone in the day that the Scriptures were recorded that they lived like a Corinthian. That was an insult to say you live like you're from Corinth. And everyone in the world knew what a wicked city the city of Corinth was. And into Corinth, God sent the Apostle Paul, and Paul preached the gospel there under the power of God, and souls were saved, and a church was started. And uh, that church then began to serve the Lord. But, but there was a problem in that church. And Paul was given these letters, First and Second Corinthians, by the Holy Spirit to write back to the church at Corinth, to help them identify and correct some of the problems that were in those churches. Because those problems had brought the work of the Lord to a standstill. And they were, uh, that church and the things that were going on in that church had begun to uh, give a black eye to the cause of Christ. And uh, so Paul was given these letters to write back to them. We've looked at some of the lessons from the conflict that we found in Corinth. And we've been trying to learn from them. We want to be the kind of church the Lord will use in the last days before the Lord comes again. We were talking to some folks yesterday morning about how we're seeing such a frequency in all of the events that are going on in the world around us, uh, in nature, and how they are, are escalating more and more. And we believe that that's uh, waking up this world for one last great effort by churches and men and women and missionaries around the world to reach people with the gospel before the Lord comes again. And uh, that's what we want to be, that kind of church. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to begin to read here. And I want to preach this morning on this subject. Every man a minister of Christ and a steward of God. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then every one of us are ministers of Christ. And we are stewards of God. And I want you to see that in the scripture this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. The Bible says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord." Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn uh, in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. And we'll stop right there, but we'll look into God's Word at this thought, this subject of every child of God, a minister of Christ and a steward of God. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for the good day you've allowed us to have. Thank you for the time we had in Sunday school. Lord, what an important thing that is, that we can come and study God's Word and establish our lives on the foundations of the truths of God's Word. Lord, we're living in a day and age today where, Lord, many of the children, the little boys and girls that we bring in from our community, they come in to our Sunday school classes and youth programs. And, Lord, they don't know even the most basic and simple great messages and stories from the Bible. They don't know about how David fought Goliath or how, Lord, you commanded Noah to build an ark. They don't know even these most common things. And, Lord, we're just asking you today to help 
uh, our people, our church, our families, people in this community to be sure that they give attention to the need to develop our lives and the lives of our children on the foundation of God's Word. Give us, Lord, a heart for Sunday school that will come out and be a part of that. Lord, we just thank you for it today and thank you for this service, for the good singing that we've had, for the beautiful uh, music that we've enjoyed, and for the special. Lord, we're just thankful for it. God, we're privileged people today. What a joy it is to come and be in this local church. What a blessing it is to our families and lives in this community. And Lord, we thank you for everyone that's here. You brought us all together in a unique way. God, thank you for your love that you have for us. And Lord, we're just excited about what you're doing and what you want to do today. And so we pray you give each of us hearts that will be open to the Word of God and ears that will hear the Holy Spirit's voice uh, quietly within our own soul and heart. And Lord, we're just asking you to help us to be obedient people today. Those of us that know you as our Savior, help us to remember that we're living in this world not to just try to live and exist, but to be a steward of God, a minister of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our purpose in this world. And Lord, we just pray that we'd not be drawn away or distracted from that. Lord, maybe somebody's come to church this morning, but never have come to Christ for salvation. When we sang the birthday song, they know the day they were born physically into this world, but there's no place in their heart and life where they know that they've been born spiritually by receiving you as their personal Savior. And so what we're praying today, your word and your spirit would do that work that we as men cannot do. And so, Lord, we look to you. Thank you for what you are going to do. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite everybody back tonight. The choir is practicing at 515, but our service is at 6. And tonight, the subject uh, for the message is going to be the Millennial Kingdom. How much do you know about the Millennial Kingdom? When will it be? What will it be like? Who will be there? How, uh, what, why will it come to an end? All of these are things we want to look at tonight. In the scripture, when we talk about the millennial kingdom, where does the church relate to that? And that's kind of what we've been studying. So I hope you'll be back tonight. Uh, but this morning, you know, when we study the Bible, every chapter in the Bible, and there's about 1,189 chapters in your Bible. There's 66 books in your Bible, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. And there's about 1,189 chapters. And every chapter in your Bible has a key verse. One verse in that chapter, which is the key to understanding it. And when you find the verse and you understand that verse, it just kind of unlocks all the truth that God wants to share with you in that chapter. And uh, we know that throughout uh, God's Word, there'll be a chapter in a book that will be the key chapter. And when you uncover the truth in that chapter, it helps you understand the whole book. I believe there's a key verse for the whole Bible that unlocks all of its truths. And I believe it's John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you want to understand what the Bible has to say to you, you're not going to understand it all at one time, but if you want to know uh, the primary message, it's that. If you're here this morning, I can tell you without hesitation, God loves you. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, He demonstrated it when He sent His Son into the world. He sent His Son, who was perfect and holy and sinless, into a sinful, unholy, unrighteous world, filled with sin, cursed with sin. And He allowed His Son to come into the world and then go to the cross. And there on the cross, He took all of our sin, unholiness, and unrighteousness upon Himself. And it all separated us from God. And our penalty was death and separation from Him forever. And His Son died in our place. He died in your place. He died in my place. And He was buried and He rose again from the grave by the power of God. God bestowing uh, upon Him eternal life. That life that is His life. Now, it is our life through faith in Him. He can give us eternal life. He will if we'll receive Him as our personal Savior. That's the, that's the great message of God's Word. He wants you to know that today. And He wants every man, woman, boy, and girl to receive Him as their Savior and be saved from sin which will separate you from God forever. If you're here this morning and never been saved, you're separated in your trespasses and sins from God. If you live your life that way and you die that way, you'll be that way forever. 
But you can receive Christ as your Savior. You can ask Him to forgive the sin that sent His Son to suffer and die on the cross. You can receive the life He wants to give you and receive justification with God. And you can have eternal life. You can do that. All men must be saved. And that's the great key to the Bible. In chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, the key verse, I think, is verse 20. The Bible says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God. Does that sound familiar? That's a familiar phrase. Especially if you remember Matthew 6.33. But seek not. But seek first the kingdom of God. Same phrase, right? Same phrase. But seek first the kingdom of God. Here he says, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And uh, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the greatest work in all the world. Furthering the kingdom of God. The, uh, the, this work of the kingdom of God, it's an eternal work. It's a work that has to do with the souls of men. It's a work that has to be done God's way. It has to be done by those God has called and ordained to do that work. It cannot be done in the power or the energy of the flesh. He says that the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. It's in power. The power of the, uh, of the Spirit of God, not the flesh and power of men. The work of God cannot be done using the wisdom of men. Paul found that out. In fact, he told us there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And he said the reason it must be in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit is so that your faith does not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where your faith needs to rest today. If you're here this morning and you profess to know Christ as your Savior, you say, I'm all right, I'm on my way to heaven today, then I hope that all that you're basing that on rests on the sure foundation of God's Word and the power of the work of Christ and not on the wisdom of men. That's where it has to stand. And Paul said that that's where the work of God has to be. God's work can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. But see, that's a problem. Because there's a conflict in our own lives. It's the power and wisdom of our flesh in opposition to the power and way of the Spirit of God. We all will fight that fight. Our flesh against the Spirit. If we know Christ is our Savior. Ultimately, The way of the flesh leads to failure and fruitlessness. If I try to do God's work in the wisdom of my own mind and the power of my own flesh and my own wisdom, I'll fail to further the kingdom of God and I'll be fruitless someday. But we know the Scriptures teach us that the way of the Spirit will further God's kingdom and it will bring forth fruit that will remain for eternity. And that's what we want to do. And you know, up until, up until now, Paul has been dealing with the church at Corinth and the divisions that are in the church. They're divided up into groups. And Paul said the problem is they're not living and serving God spiritually. They're doing it carnally. And that's created all these problems. Now Paul's going to, going to begin to teach them again and remind them of the responsibility as God's people to humbly take their place. And to fulfill their calling as ministers of Christ and stewards of God. I think it's interesting in verse 1. I want you to notice the first thing here. Paul gives a self-description. A self-description in verse 1. He says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, if you'll also look down at what he says about them in verse 6 and 7. He said, In these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos. What things? Well, he's talking about what he said in verse 1. The fact that he accounts himself as a minister of Christ, a steward of God. Not only him, but he also thinks that way of Apollos. And he said, I'm taking these and I'm transferring these uh, figures into myself and to Apollos that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. And in verse 7, Paul gets really rough and plain with these people. And he asks them a question. He says, for who maketh thee different from another? 
You, you all are making differences among yourself. And you're dividing yourself among the church. But who's making those differences among you? It was them, wasn't it? It wasn't God, it was them. And then he goes on and he asks them, And what hast thou that you did not receive? Some of them are puffed up with some gift or some talent or ability that they had. And Paul says, where did you get that? And the answer is, God gave them that gift. God gave them that talent. God gave them that gift. God gave them that ability. And he reminds them again. He said, and if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? In other words, uh, why are you making yourself something when without what God has done for you, you'd be nothing. And Paul, Paul gives them then that great self-description. You know, it's interesting, when you study the New Testament books that we have, we believe Paul is responsible through the Holy Spirit for at least 13 of the 27 we have. And when you read them, and if you would just sometime do that, don't do it now, but do it some other time. Start with uh, the book of Romans and in First and Second Corinthians and, and First and Second uh, Thessalonians. And go right through your Bible, uh, those books that Paul uh, was the penman for. And notice in the first verses of the first chapters how he introduces himself and that person that might be with him. And uh, he always he always gives an introduction, except in the book or the letters to Thessalonica, and in the letter of Hebrews. But in all the rest, he introduces himself and uh, and that person that might be serving with him. And I thought it was interesting to see how Paul described himself in relationship to Christ, because that's what he does when he introduces himself. Uh, when I looked at these things, I saw in seven of those books, he introduces himself as an apostle, an apostle of God, an apostle of Christ. He sees himself in that way. Uh, we found that uh, three different times he introduces himself as a servant, a servant of Christ. Uh, one time he introduces himself in the book of Philemon as a slave, as a servant. And, you know, when I began to look at that, I, and then when I saw what he said in the first verse of chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, you know what it did? It makes me consider how I view my life in relationship to the Lord. We don't usually introduce ourselves to people that way. I'm a little different maybe than you are because sometimes I will introduce myself. I'm a pastor. My name's Pastor. I'm the pastor of this church. So I'm a little different in that regard. But most of us, in a day-in, day-out basis with people that we might meet. We'll introduce ourselves, we'll tell them our name, but very rarely do we share with them how we see our relationship with Christ. But you know, really, the Christian life's all about that, isn't it? Relating Christ and our relationship with Him to others. And that's how Paul is helping these people to see themselves here, because they're not seeing themselves in their relationship to Christ the way Paul did. And it caused me to think about that. I'll never, I'll never be able to say with someone I'm an apostle simply because the office and calling of an apostle is a, is a ministry or an office that has died out now with the completion of the New Testament Scriptures. There's, never, there's no need for that office anymore, the office of an apostle. And uh, when it comes to being a prisoner, uh, well, not yet. Some of you remember it's been a joke around here a little bit, and some of you probably caught it, but I was preaching one Sunday night, and we were talking about the two witnesses that are going to be killed and resurrected during the tribulation period, and we were talking about how uh, uh, it's a Muslim practice to often put on TV or the Internet actually executions of, of uh, prisoners, and they'll show that publicly, try to get as many people to see it as we can. And, and I made the comment uh, that, uh, you know, in relationship to uh, when we captured Osama bin Laden, that there's a great debate among our people about whether or not we should make those pictures public, whether we should publicize them. And with the Muslims, it's not a debate. They, they, if, they, if they were some way able to get one of our high-ranking officials and capture him, they would publish his execution on every means available to them. But when I tried to express that, instead of saying Osama, I said Obama. <laughs> I didn't catch it until after it was over. And I noticed then later some of the folks were kind of looking at the back door and... 
looking at the side doors. It's like the SWAT team is going to come crashing through. And, you know, we publish every service and post them on the Internet and on our website, and we have a YouTube channel. They all go out on the uh, World Wide Web, and so it's kind of been a joke around here. And, in fact, it was funny the other day I told our church uh, a few Wednesdays ago there was a, a, a uh, an Air Force honor guard that came down from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and they were doing a funeral right here behind us, and they came early and wanted a place to rest and change clothes and get ready for that. But they had a dark blue van with real dark windows, and uh, they pulled up on our lot, and out comes these servicemen in fatigues. And uh, Angie's looking out the window, and she texts me over and wants to know what's going on. I said, I don't know, something about Obama and the Internet. <laughs> Uh, but I thought uh, Homeland Security finally came in on me. But I'm not, I can't say that I've been a prisoner for Christ yet, although Paul could have done that. He did do that. But you know what? We are to see ourselves as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to see ourselves that way. And uh, the problem here in Corinth is that the people had had an opinion of themselves that Paul did not share with them when he saw his relationship with the Lord. They were divided among groups, one with another. And this group was, uh, was in opposition to the other group because this group uh, felt more gifted than that group, or whatever the case may be. And Paul did not see himself in that way at all. The Corinthians had allowed themselves to become puffed up to become prideful. They had made themselves out to be something that they were not in themselves apart from Christ. And, uh, you know, he said to them there in that first verse, let a man so account of us. Let a man, he says, any man, look at us and measure us uh, all uh, about who, all who know the Lord. Let them measure us as ministers of Christ and stewards of God. He said, that's the way we should see ourselves, and that's the way the world should see us. As, as ministers of Christ and stewards of God. You know, everyone who knows Christ as their Savior, who has been made to be at peace with God, we are to be ministers of Christ and stewards of God. Notice what he says there, uh, the stewards are the mysteries of God. What's he talking about, the mysteries of God? Well, you can hold your place and let me read to you a verse of Scripture in the book of First Timothy, the third chapter, in the 16th verse. And uh, the Bible says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Here's the mystery. This is the mystery that Paul is saying that every believer has been made a steward of. He says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. You know what that is in a nutshell? That's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? And the Bible saying that every child of God is a minister of Christ and a steward of the gospel of Christ. We, we, are, to, we are to have that relationship with our Savior. We are to, uh, we're to embrace that and we are to let the world know that that's who we are in relationship with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we know today that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, maybe, maybe the truth of this mystery might have been hidden in the Old Testament, but now with the completion of the New Testament, we have it fully understandable that Christ loved us and, and God sent His Son and His Son became flesh and went to the cross and paid our sin debt, was buried, rose again and lives today to give eternal life. What a great mystery uh, it was at one time. Now, you know, the mystery of it all is why God would do that. But the Bible said because He loved us, didn't He? And that's hard to understand. You know what's equally as hard to understand about all of that is, is, that, uh, is that God desires to use each of us in our lives to glorify Him, to live and labor for Him as His ministers and His stewards. That's a great mystery. We each have that privilege that know the Lord is our Savior. 
He wants to use our lives for His honor and glory. You know, the question I would have to you this morning, if you know Christ as your Savior, are you taking advantage of that great privilege? Are you living your life to be His servant? Are you sharing your life with others uh, uh, through Christ living through you? Uh, Because someday, if you do those things, you'll see eternal things have been accomplished through the life that you place in the hands of the Lord. But are you taking advantage of that? Are you making that a part of your life? Uh, But Paul gives here a self-description that should be the same for all of us. But he takes that a step further. I want you to see a second thing. We find a scriptural definition of his description. Notice what he's saying. He's talking about two things here. He's talking about ministers and he's talking about stewards. Now, if we take those two things and we try to scripturally define them, the first thing we're going to find as we are concerned with this idea of being a minister is the word minister really just simply means a servant. You know, a lot of times people call preachers ministers, and that's true, but really it's not specific to a preacher. It's specific to every child of God. We're all to be servants, and we're to serve one another. But we're to be ministers, servants. It it has the idea of being a subordinate. Now, this is the literal meaning of the word that's used in 1 Corinthians 4.1. It means an under rower. An under rower. I didn't know what that meant until I began to think about this time. You know, one of the things we have to do when we study God's Word is we have to, we have to sometimes visualize ourselves living in that day because there are things different about that day than there are today. And when we understand that, it makes more sense. What the idea in this Word was, was the, uh, it was the idea behind uh, uh, nautical terms. You remember in this day, uh, the Romans and the Greeks had powerful ships, war galleys that sailed the seas at that time. And they were often multi-decked. And in those decks and uh, on the deck and below, they would, they would be slaves who would be chained to their seat. They would have an oar in their hand. And their sole life was to keep that ship moving forward wherever the, uh, wherever the captain pointed the, uh, that ship. Uh, they were to push that ship when it went into battle. Uh, often they would deliver goods from one place to another. Or sometimes they may carry an important message from one place to the other place. But they would row on that oar and they would, uh, they would move to the beat and rhythm of that drummer who marked their time. And uh, they couldn't look out of that ship. They couldn't look up. Uh, They couldn't see beyond their task. Every day they lived to do the same thing every day. Uh, The the lowest uh, of them were the ones that were on the bottom deck. They were the under rowers. They were the ones that were at the very bottom. Often these were the men that would have been taken uh, because they committed some terrible crime. And instead of being executed, they would be put to the bottom of those holds and those galleys. The worthless off-scourings of human civilization. And there they would fulfill their role and fill out the rest of their life rowing those great ships. And Paul said, when you look at me, that's how you measure me in my relationship to Christ, my Savior. He said, I'm nothing but an under rower. Paul remembered no doubt where he used to be and what he used to be without Christ. He was a, he was a persecutor of the church of God. He was responsible for putting to death the lives of Christian men and women who were trying to serve God and live for Him before he got saved. And Paul counted himself as simply an under rower for the cause of Christ. He says in verse 6, I, I have in a figure transferred to myself this picture of being a servant, an under rower. You know, I couldn't help but think of some things that Paul had said in some other portions of the Scripture. You remember when he said, the love of Christ constraineth me? And uh, the idea was to be set in bonds because uh, of, the, of the love that he had for God and the love that he knew God had had for him to save him and to, and to put him in the ministry and allow him to serve the Lord. And that thing bound up Paul. It, it constrained him. It set the course for his life. It kept him moving forward and, and uh, kept him doing what God had called him to do the rest of his life. Paul said in one place, I'm a debtor unto all men. I said, I feel like because of all that God allowed me to know and because I have 
had to, I've had the opportunity to come into contact with the gospel which has saved me. I owe it to all men to share with them the gospel of Christ. And can't you just get that picture of Paul, how he saw himself there, chained with chains of love to the oar of serving God, never going to let up, never going to quit, never going to look right or left, keep moving forward the rest of his life, uh, growing that uh, life that he had to the beat and direction of Christ and the Holy Spirit and uh, taking that great gospel message and the goods of the grace of God anywhere God would direct him to go. And you know, that's how we're to see ourselves. That's how we're to see ourselves. And then Paul said, you can account me also as a steward of the mysteries of God. And we know a steward was a manager of another's household and another's goods. The things they managed were not their own, they were another's. They were a distributor of and a dispenser of that which is not their own. Uh, often, though, that master of the household would leave them a signet ring which gave them his authority, that they were acting on his behalf. And the things they did uh, were as good as the decisions that he might make himself. And uh, he would give them that much authority. They could act independently, but they were always accountable to their owner. And Paul said, that's what I am. I'm a steward a steward of the gospel of Christ, a steward of all that the Lord Jesus has given me. You know, the Lord Jesus always uh, often emphasized this idea of stewardship in the New Testament. If you want to uh, someday turn and read in your Bibles in Matthew 21, uh, there's a parable there of two sons. It begins in the 28th verse and it says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether the twain of them did the will of his father. And here, the Lord Jesus is giving this parable about being servants. And uh, uh, you've got two men, two sons of God. One said, uh, I won't do it. But then he repented and realized that It was his duty to go, and he went. And another said, oh, I'll go, I'll go, but he never did go. And then the Bible asked the question, which of those two, of those two, uh, were uh, faithful and did the will of his father? And we know, of course, the first one did. But here's the thing about this, uh, of being a servant. Uh, I want you to notice that God has asked each of us to be servants and to serve Him in the harvest field of this world because it's an unfinished work. You see in this parable that the, that the man who had the two sons, the father who had the fields where the work needed to be done, he's God the Father. And uh, he has some sons. And he sent those sons into the fields because there was a work that wasn't finished. Do you see what he said to them to do in verse 28? He said, go work. You know, the same thing is, is being said to all of us here today. If we know Christ is our Savior, He's saying, go work for me today because there's an unfinished work. I saw it on TV the other day. We were somewhere in a restaurant or something. They were holding up a baby. And you know what the significance of that child was? Number 7 billion alive in the world. We've reached 7 billion people alive in this world. There's never been more people alive on planet Earth at any one time than there are right now. And we've never been closer to Christ coming again than we are right now. And so the work has never been greater. And the need has never been greater. And the call has never been louder. Go and work for me today. And every one of us must take our place because the work is unfinished. I want you to notice something else in that parable. The work is urgent. Do you see what he says? Son, go work today. Today, not tomorrow, not next week, not not next year. Go to work today. There's an urgency about the work of the Lord. Time is crucial. And then he said uh, that the work of God is unique because he said, go work today. And you know what he said there? In my vineyard. My. You know what God sees when He sees this world? All seven billion people in this world, He sees every one of them as someone that His Son suffered and died for. Every one of them. They... They, 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 had a, they had a debt of sin that they owe God. And all of it was put on His Son when His Son died on the cross. 
And every one of them is a soul that His Son Christ suffered and bled and died for and lives today for and can save today if they will turn to Him. And this is a, this is a unique work that God is calling us to do because we're to go to souls for whom Christ the Son died for. We're to be His servants. And then we're to be His stewards. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 33, you have another parable there. It says, Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit grew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. This is a parable about stewardship right here. The, the, the father or the owner of the of the, of the vineyard, the householder, that's God the Father. And he has a vineyard. And he has hired husbandmen to take care of it and to make investment in it and have fruit for it. And you and I are the husbandmen. We're the stewards. It's not our vineyard. But you notice what it says? In the time, he's going to send his servants and he's going to require of us what fruit that we have as good stewards brought forth for Him out of that which is His. This is a parable about stewardship. We're to be good stewards. Notice some things that it says there. God has done and given all for us. You know that? Just like He tried to tell that church in Corinth. What is it that you have that you haven't been given? We have had everything we have God has done for us. God has given all. That's what He said in verse 33. He has a vineyard that He planted. He hedged. He digged a wine press in it. He built a tower around it. He's done everything necessary for that vineyard to bring forth its fruit. And uh, we, we have to realize today He's done all of that for us. God has then secondly given to all His servants uh, to be distributed and invested. He, notice what it says there. He let it out to them. That means he, he put them in charge of it. He's put us in charge of His harvest field. No one is going to go into the harvest field and seek to gain fruit and win souls for Christ but those that know Him as their Savior. Our government's not going to do it. You know? Some civic organization can't do that. No, the whole thing about this is is the kingdom of God. Remember the verse in verse 20, the key verse? This work, this great work of God, it's only for those God has called and ordained to do it. And it's you and I that God has called. It's you and I that He's ordained as ministers and servants. And then He says, God expects a return from His investment when the time of the fruit draws near. That time's very close. The Lord's coming again and uh, He expects an investment. When the time of the fruit drew near, He sent His service to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits of it. And uh, you know, I'm thankful today that I'm saved. I'm thankful I cannot lose my salvation. I'm thankful that there are rewards that can be won in eternity. But I also know that I could lose those rewards. I can, I can know what it means to live without the blessings of God or the honor of God on my life if I don't wisely live as a faithful steward. That's what He wants for us to do. Paul said, this is the scriptural definition of how I'm describing how we are to be in our relationship with the Lord. Ministers and stewards. But notice he says a third thing. He gives a sovereign declaration in verse 2. He says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Paul speaks to the Corinthians who thought so much of other men and divided themselves among the followers of men, and who, who, uh, who, who, who were prideful in their own talents and their own personalities. And he told those people, the measuring rod of God for his ministers and servants has nothing to do with how talented you are, how gifted you are, how educated you are, how eloquent you are, or how benevolent you are. He says, when God measured you, As a steward, He doesn't measure you by any of those things. He said the measuring rod of God for a steward is how faithful you are. Isn't that what He says? Moreover, it is required. Moreover, in other words, above everything else, it's required 
and stewards that a man be found faithful. I'm so thankful that's that way. Because if it was for me having to play the saxophone, I'd be out. Or if it was me for up here having to stand to sing a song like Doug did, you count me out. And it wouldn't take long before you see I've got not much to offer. But you know what? Though none of us are able to do all things, and any of us cannot do necessarily what the other person does, all of us can do one thing. As a child of God, we can be faithful. Amen. Faithful to the Lord. And he said in the end, that's the measuring rod. It's not how gifted or talented or any of these other things. Those are all gifts I give you, God says. And you have nothing to boast of in those things. But what about your faithfulness? He said, that's how I'm measuring it. That's what I'm going to use. The measuring rod is, the, is this idea of being faithful. Moreover, above all else, faithful. What does he mean when he says faithful? I think, first of all, he's talking about believing and being believed. Believing Him and being believable as we believe Him. Does that make sense? You know, it's the idea of being a Bible-believing Christian. Seeking and applying the truths of God's Word to my life. Watering up my family on the truths of God's Word. Faithfully staying with it. No matter what anything else is going on around me. God choosing Him, His way, His Word, His will for my life and my family. And you know what? What that does, it ensures that our testimony is genuine. It means that I'm not just saying one thing out of one side of my mouth and doing something else, which would make me a hypocrite, wouldn't it? God said, no, you've got to be faithful. What you're trying to win people to has to be what has won you. And what you're trying to convince people to give their life to, you have had to give your life to it. And there has to be a life there that's both believing the Word of God and living it so that it is believable. I think that's what it means to be faithful. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 there in the 5th verse, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. You know what that word unfeigned means? It means genuine. There's a lot of people who can put on a good show. But you know what? It's not going to mean anything and it's not going to be effective. It's the people that have genuine faith that has changed their life. That's what's going to make the difference. He wants us to be believing and believable. And then he wants us, secondly, to be trustworthy and responsible. We have to realize that all we have is the Lord's and we have to make wise decisions with what we do, with what we have. Uh, you know, there's so, so many great illustrations of that, but in Matthew, the 25th chapter of Matthew and the 23rd verse, uh, there's a great uh, statement. It says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. We focus all of our attention on the phrase, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's good. But you know what I think the most important part of that verse is? The last part. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You know what I think that means? I think that means that, that uh, you know, if we make wise decisions, if we are good stewards, if we are faithful, faithful, believing Him, and being believable, then we're going to live our life in the joy of the Lord. And it's not going to matter what the circumstances in life are. Good times come and good times go. Bad times come and bad times go. Things are up, things are down. Things are bright, things are dark. But you know what? If I know that I'm believing the Lord and living faithfully and obeying His Word and I'm, I'm trustworthy, he can, he can give me something to do, and I'll be faithful to do it. Nothing else matters, and nothing can touch that joy that's in your heart, knowing that you're serving the Lord. Enter in. Are you living in the joy of your salvation? Do you realize what happened every times in the Scripture where we see people have gotten away from the Lord, and their life is not where it should be, and they're not serving Him and living for Him? Uh, they lose that joy of what it means to be a Christian. That's all a part of being forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Christ. Confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And David said in Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Help me enjoy being saved again. 
And we can only do that when we're serving the Lord. When we're a steward, we're a minister. And then the idea of being responsible and trustworthy. You know what, what makes a, a child really begin to feel like there's something? And, you know, we have such a fine line there at their parents when we start to give our children some responsibility and start to treat them like they're grown up a little bit, you know. And uh, may have been some time uh, in your childhood where your parents just maybe pulled up on the parking lot and they gave you a dollar or whatever and said, run in the store and get that. Bring it out for me. Boy, wow, I'm responsible. I can do that. And uh, we go in there and may, maybe we accomplish the task. You know, maybe it was go get a gallon of milk or whatever and run back out. Or maybe we went in as a child and we got distracted and we bought two comic books and some bubble gum and we run back out. Oh, forgot the milk. You know, we lived selfishly there for a little bit. We forgot what we were here for. Okay. But you know, when we're faithful, God can give us something to do because we're responsible. Because we'll be faithful. That's the idea of being a good steward. God gives every child of God the same opportunity to be faithful. And then there's this idea of a single dedication in verses 3, 4, and 5 here. He says, Therefore, judge nothing. For I know, uh, he says in verse 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know that nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Here Paul's telling them to live with a single dedication. As God's measuring rod is our faithfulness, don't forget that it's God who does the measuring. We forget that sometimes, don't we? God does the measuring. When the life of a child of God is to be evaluated, Paul said it's not to be done by another man. It's not going to be done by another man. He talks about three things. First of all, he talks about the court of public opinion in verse 3. He says, but with me. And by the way, Paul already knew everything the church had been saying about him. In fact, later on, he defends himself to some of their charges and accusations. But you know what it all meant to Paul? Nothing. You know what he said? He said, it's a small thing that I should be judged of you or any man's judgment. And in a nutshell, basically what Paul's saying is, I don't really care what you think about me. That's what he's saying, isn't it? He's saying it doesn't really matter to me what you gather around in your little groups and whisper about me is. Because in the end, it really doesn't matter what the court of public opinion says. Now, I say that and I, 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 I caution this. We should be sensitive to what others think, but not subject to their opinions. We should desire to live peaceably with all men, shouldn't we? We should live blamelessly. We should live harmlessly. We should live so that all men are at peace with us as much as we are able, although that's impossible, but we should strive to do it. But in the end, we cannot let what other people think about us dictate how faithfully we serve God. And so Paul's saying it doesn't really matter. The public, a court of public opinion. So many people are hindered from serving the Lord faithfully because they let the world judge them. And they give in to that. You know, the second thing he talks about is the court of a tainted conscience. I want you to see what he says. He says, not only do I not judge myself according to what men say about me, but look what he says in the last part of verse 3. Yea, I judge not mine own self. I judge not mine own self. What's he saying there, Pastor? He says, well, you know, God gives a man a conscience. Each of us are born with a conscience. And the conscience is kind of like a stoplight. It'll give you the green light if it's okay or the red light if it's something we shouldn't do. God gives us that so that all men are accountable. All men have the ability from God to know the difference between right and wrong. He gives us a conscience. But you know what happens over a period of time is that as a man can disregard his conscience until he deceives his own heart into thinking that he's right even when he's wrong because he doesn't heed his conscience until before a certain period of time he doesn't even hear it. You remember what Jeremiah said about your heart? It's deceitful and desperately wicked. You know what's the wrong thing to tell people today? Just follow your heart. 
Just do whatever you feel like you should. That's absolutely the wrong thing to say to people. Because our hearts are wicked. They're deceitful. They're of the flesh. They will do what is opposed to the will of God, to the Word of God, to the way of God. We can't live by the flesh and feelings. We have to live by faith and obedience to the Word of God. And so Paul says, I don't even judge myself. Because there's times when maybe I am at fault. And yet, I've listened to people ridicule me and persecute me so long that I, 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 don't even, I can't even see it when I am wrong. I've just set myself to opposing them so long that now I, I don't even know when I'm wrong. When that criticism is justified or not. Because he, he, his heart could deceive himself. It, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we have, to, we have to think about. Because a lot of times... You know, uh, if we listen to ourselves, then we'll, we'll justify not being faithful to church, not reading our Bible, not praying, not tithing, not giving. We can justify all that away. And we can convince ourselves in our mind that we're right, even when we're wrong. And Paul said, I can't even judge my own self. He said, no, I can't do that. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to listen to me. And then uh, Paul goes on to talk about in the fifth verse, you know, we're not to judge before it's time. Uh, you know, what we're guilty of doing with people sometimes is we pass judgment upon them. Well, God still work. God's still working on them. And we pass judgment on them before God's finished. And before they're finished responding, he said, no, not until it's time. And then he talks about the fourth thing. And he talks about the Supreme Court of the Lord. He says, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. It's the Lord that judgeth, isn't it? He's going to be the judge. Paul says that when it's time, it'll be the Lord Jesus who judges us faithfully. And he'll do it justly. And he'll do it righteously. Uh, you can turn and look in some of the scripture, Matthew 25 again, uh, there where that, uh, where that master said to his servant, well done. The Lord knows when to say that, doesn't he? He'll know who to say that to. Mark chapter 12, uh, you can turn there sometime and read in Mark 12, uh, verse 41 down through verse number 44. And in that passage of Scripture there, you have this, uh, you have this uh, parable, this instance of, uh, of all of these wealthy people uh, giving their tithes and casting their money into the treasury. And there was a poor widow there who only had two mites. And uh, she took the two mites she had and cast them both into the treasury. And in the end, the Lord Jesus, judging righteously, said, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had. And God's able to judge righteously. Isn't it? There's a lot of people today who have a lot, and we give God just a little tip. And then there's other people who really give till it hurts. And God's keeping the record, isn't He? He knows. And uh, God, in the end, is going to be that faithful judge. I just want to ask you today as we finish up, you know, do you know and realize how privileged we are to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? A steward of the gospel of Christ. And that's how we should see ourselves. That's how we should want a lost and a dying world to see us. And we should want to uh, make the most of the privilege we have of serving Him and living for Him. How is it in our lives? Are we that under rower set and, and strapped with chains of love to the, to the oar of service for the Lord moving forward? Are we that steward has been, who has been given so much? Everything we have, God has given it to us. And we want to seek wisely to invest it back so that we can further the kingdom of God. This is a great need in the church and court. And I believe it's a great need in all of our lives. And uh, we want to encourage you today to be that minister, be that steward the Lord has called you to be because no one else can do what God has called you to do. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you say there's never been a time and a place in my life where I've been saved, I want to encourage you today. The Bible says you must be saved. You must be. And if that's never taken place, we want to invite you today to let us take a Bible and show you from the Scripture how you can know Christ as your Savior. How you can have forgiveness of the debt of sin that separates you from God. How you can have His presence in your life today and to be in His presence for eternity.
Let's pray together today. Father, we ask you to bless this time. Thank you for the services we've had. All that's been done this morning, we give you praise for. We ask that your word will be effective and powerful in our life. We pray today, God, for the invitation that your will would be done. We pray as God's people that we would respond to you as it, as it should please you. Lord, with obedient and faithful hearts, desiring to be ministers of Christ and stewards of the gospel. Well, we pray for a soul today that's here that's unsaved. Maybe somebody that's come to church that has never come to Christ. Maybe a man and a wife, a, a husband and a wife. Maybe, uh, maybe a young couple or maybe someone at, uh, at the uh, latter end of their years. Whatever the case may be, we're just looking to you, Lord, to speak to them. Lord, all of us must be saved from our sin or our sin will destroy us and keep us from you for eternity. Lord, we're praying today, thanking you that you love us, you gave your Son for us, you offer unto us eternal life and the privilege of serving you and making a difference in eternity. Lord, we pray if there's somebody here today unsaved, that God, they would seek you today while you can be found. We just ask you, God, to do what only you can do in the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.